All right, uh, well, let me begin by thanking Peter for the kind uh, introduction and invitation. I would say this is a bit uh, bittersweet uh, for me in that Copenhagen is one of my favorite cities in the world. I would definitely prefer to be there at the moment. So that's the bitter part of that, uh, but it's sweet in that I think this format does allow a significant attendance that may not have occurred otherwise. And so I welcome all of you uh, to this event. Uh, good morning, North America. Good afternoon, Europe. Good evening, Asia. Uh, great to see you all uh, today. So when Peter invited me to give this talk, I sent him several uh, possible topics. And the one that he selected is shown here, atomically thin neuromorphic computing materials and devices. And this is uh, an effort that is relatively new in our laboratory. And a lot of things I'll be talking about today, uh, this is the first time that I've done it. So let's see how it goes. So I'll begin uh, with an outline. And uh, what I'm gonna talk about today is first an introduction and motivation for neuromorphic computing. Uh, and then I'm going to move on to uh, what I call anti-ambipolar heterojunctions and how these can be used to achieve uh, exquisite spiking behavior in uh, neuromorphic uh, devices. And then move on to so-called molydisulfide mem transistor devices, devices that combine memristic behavior with transistor behavior. We'll note here on the outline that I also have included a recent review article that's just come online in Nature Nano. And in this article, uh, we go through and outline where nanomaterials have an opportunity to impact neuromorphic technology. Well, let me begin with an introduction and motivation to try to get everyone on the same page. So the point of this slide is to give a brief history of artificial intelligence. And the ultimate objective of artificial intelligence is to mechanize human thought. And this concept is not a new one. It's been around since at least the 17th century. Gottfried, uh, Gottfried Leibniz suggested that reasoning could be reduced to calculation. Of course, there were no real calculation machines back then that could realize that vision. And it took a few hundred years before around the middle of the 20th century, we began to see computing machines achieving functionality that could beat that of humans in certain tasks. Uh, one, of fa one famous example is Alan Turing's efforts to do code breaking during World War II. Concurrent to that effort, uh, John Van Neumann began to outline the architecture that now dominates digital computing today. And that architecture coupled with advances in solid state electronic devices, of course, set us off onto Moore's law, ever increasing computational capability and in integrated circuits to the point where in 1997, IBM supercomputer Deep Blue could actually beat the reigning world chess champion, Gary Kasparov. And over the next 20 years uh, up to the present, of course, artificial intelligence has become increasingly important in society. I'll note that AI and machine learning market uh, is projected by Forbes uh, to grow to a market of $58 billion by 2021. What I wanna stress though is that uh, much of this activity is occurring in software and still utilizing conventional digital computers as the underlying hardware. And while that does gain you some advantages in some applications, it comes at the cost of very high power consumption. And so the question is, can we do artificial intelligence in a more energy efficient manner? And that brings us to the concept of neuromorphic computing. Can we now better mimic how the brain does computation? The big difference between a digital computer and the brain is that the brain is much more efficient from a power consumption perspective. And so if we were to compare the brain to a conventional transistor circuit, we can see that silicon CMOS can mimic the function of biological neurons, but they have almost no resemblance of form. By that I mean a silicon wafer is of course a planar rigid substrate, uh, whereas the brain is soft, malleable, and three-dimensional. And perhaps more fundamentally from a computation perspective in a digital computer, memory and information processing are performed in separate locations. This is the so-called von Neumann architecture. And as the amount of data has increased with time and you need to transport that data back and forth between the memory and information processing blocks, you've seen growth in, uh, in power dissipation, uh, which is very different, of course, from the brain. On the other hand, we have devices that have attempted to realize some of the functionality of neurons, such as memristors. And in many senses, they do resemble the form of ion channels and synapses. 
But these memristors are uh, traditionally used in memory, but not for information processing, whereas neurons can do both. In addition, memristors are typically limited to two terminal geometries, whereas neurons will have hundreds to thousands of interconnections. And so there's clear differences uh, in both of these technologies from how the brain does computation, at least at a hardware level. And as a result, in our laboratory over the past few years, we've tried to rethink neuromorphic devices from the bottom up. And instead of taking this and trying to make the memristor better, which is how a lot of people look at neuromorphic computing, what we want to do is, is rethink solid state electronics completely and begin and think about what a neuron does and think about how we could realize that in a solid state electronic device. And so ideally, such devices would be able to achieve sophisticated voltage spiking analogous to neurons. This would require highly nonlinear current voltage characteristics. We want to perform, perform both memory and information processing functions at the device level combining, for example, the memristor and transistor into one device. And we want to be able to have multiple terminals to each device to enable a higher degree of interconnectivity than we achieve in memristor two terminal arrays or even three terminal transistor arrays. And so the way that we're pursuing this in our laboratory is to consider this from the perspective of new materials. A silicon has done a great job in digital computing. Uh, it's not clear to me that it can do as good a job as a hardware platform for neuromorphic computing. And so low-dimensional electronic materials present some advantages, or at least differences, from silicon that we hope will be advantages in the neuromorphic context. I think the individuals visiting uh, this uh, seminar today probably know most of these materials, but today we're going to be talking a bit about carbon, since this is the Carbon Hagen Conference, and you're going to see in particular some carbon nanotubes throughout the talk, a one-dimensional form of sp2 bonded carbon. We're going to be focusing on the semiconducting carbon nanotubes today. We're also going to be looking at some two-dimensional semiconductors. So most prominently, we'll be looking at moly disulfide, which is an n-type semiconductor, which nicely partners with the typically p-type doped carbon nanotubes. And we'll also see a bit of phosphorine or black phosphorus showing up in today's talk. What these materials, though, present uh, from a more qualitative perspective is the possibility of introducing mechanical flexibility into electronics, uh, which would better match the form of the brain. And in addition, uh, the screening length for electromagnetic fields is greater than the thickness of these materials, which means that the possibility of electrostatic modulation of device functionality is greater in the low dimensional limit than we would have in bulk semiconductors. That concept we're going to be explaining over and over and over again in today's talk. The thing that I want to stress is that we could take those constituent materials and stack them into heterostructures, and this could be done in one dimensionality system like a 2D, 2D heterostructure, which is what many people in this field have been working on for the past few years. Uh, but our approach is to try to exploit the mixed dimensionality that is possible in Van der Waals heterostructures. Today, we're going to be seeing a lot of 2D, 1D mixed dimensional heterostructure devices. And what mixed dimensionality allows from a physics perspective is the possibility of discontinuously and qualitatively changing the nature of the electronic density of states across the hetero interface. For example, in 1D materials, we have strong Van Hove singularities in the density of states, whereas 2D materials have an energetically flat density of states. In addition, from the perspective of electrostatics, the screening that you would have in a 1D carbon nanotube array is quite different than you get in a, a homogeneous 2D semiconductor. And that's going to imply that if you were to gate either side of a mixed dimensional heterostructure, that you're going to have asymmetric electrostatic control, which is going to give you a greater tunability over the nonlinear current voltage characteristics, which is going to allow us to mimic neuronal function better than we could in a single dimensionality heterostructure. Uh, with that said, uh, in our lab, we've been pushing this mixed dimensional concept for the past two or three years, and we find that it's not only useful in neuromorphic computing, which is what I'll be primarily talking about today, but it's useful in other contexts. I don't have time to cover all these topics today, but if you are interested, I encourage you to look at this Nature Review Materials Review article where we've outlined opportunities for low dimensional materials in quantum information science with an eye towards quantum computing. 
Uh, we also have very active efforts in our laboratory and solid state batteries, uh, which could be useful in many contexts, including renewable energy technologies and electric vehicles. We've also been pushing the concept of polymorphic heterostructures, in this case, between borophene and graphene, where we exploit the polymorphic bonding that can occur in 2D systems like boron to achieve lateral heterostructures with atomically sharp interfaces, even though the materials are not lattice or even symmetry matched. But again, although I offered all these topics to Peter uh, when he invited me, I'm gonna focus today on neuromorphic computing uh, since we have a limited time today. So that brings me into the heart of the talk. And the first concept I wanna introduce is an anti-ambipolar heterojunction. The first time that we observed anti-ambipolar behavior was back in 2013. So let me briefly give you that historical precedent. And what we were doing at the time was looking at making heterojunction diodes between N-type molybdenum disulfide and P-type single-walled carbon nanotubes. And in the initial device, what we had was a lateral uh, overlapped uh, PN junction from the nanotubes and the MOS2. And on the back of this device, we would have a dielectric and then an underlying gate. So we could then gate uh, this PN heterojunction diode. And what you see in the two terminal response is what you'd expect for a P injunction diode, and that is a rectifying IV curve, as you see in the light blue plot here. This, of course, is not new. Our rectifying diode characteristics have been around since the 1930s. But what was interesting about this device is that, again, because the materials are atomically thin and we have incomplete screening of vertically applied electric fields, we can now gate this two terminal device and make it a three terminal device. And as you change the gate potential, you're electrostatically doping the PNN side of the junction, tuning the doping profile, and thereby changing the rectification ratio of the diode to the point where you can vary that by five orders of magnitude, tuning it from basically a resistor to a rectifying PN junction. From the perspective of a three-terminal IV curve, if you look at the drain current as a function of gate, you now see what we call an anti-ambipolar transfer curve where the device is off at high negative or high positive voltage when you fully deplete the N or P side of the junction respectively, it's only on at low voltage. So this is the flipped over version of an ambipolar curve, hence the name anti-ambipolar. Now that first generation design was quite crude. You notice the operating voltages were high, uh, the currents were low. And so we began to think about how to make this device better. And in particular, how it could go to wafer scale. Now, back in 2013, CVD MOS2 was pretty new, not very good yet. And as a result, we we're using Scotch tape MOS2. And so we had to switch away from MOS2. And in particular, we went to another N type semiconductor, namely indium gallium zinc oxide, which you can easily process at wafer scale. A semiconducting carbon nanotube networks can also be processed at wafer scale. And that allowed us to achieve now anti ambipolar heterojunctions at wafer scale where we were more careful with the dielectric, we made it thinner and higher K, and that allowed us to also lower the operating voltages of these devices. And if we look at the resulting current voltage characteristics, we see that anti-ambipolarity anti is not unique to nanotubes MOS2. It can be done uh, with any two uh, semiconductors as long as one of them is atomically thin, in this case, the carbon nanotubes. And you can see that we get now very nice anti-ambipolar characteristics. You'll note the operating voltages are now down to much more reasonable levels. We get nice peak in the current. And on the linear scale, you see an almost perfect Gaussian transfer curve. And as a result, many people refer to these devices as Gaussian heterojunction transistors. In fact, you'll hear me refer to them as such later in the talk. Now, at this point, we asked the question, what can you do with an anti-ambipolar characteristic? And the first thing that we demonstrated is that we could achieve a variety of analog signal conditioning functionality. For example, if we apply an AC dither to the gate voltage and we now position the DC offset of that AC dither to be on the center of our anti-ambipolar anti characteristic, that will imply that half of the sine wave will see a positive transconductance, the other half will see a negative transconductance. The negative transconductance flips the sine of the sine wave for half of its period, which is equivalent to doubling the frequency. And so you can achieve very efficient frequency doubling. And if you move the DC offset off of the peak position, you can achieve more sophisticated signal conditioning, including phase and frequency shift keying. 
And that's useful for some communications applications, but to be perfectly honest with you, there are many other ways of achieving the same functionality. And so I think it's fair to say that if this is all we could do with an anti-ambipolar device, that it would be of more academic than practical interest. Indeed, I would say that this device in its current form has limited options for neuromorphic computing. And so we decided to redesign the device completely. That took us a few years. And so if we fast forward to 2018, let me introduce one of the key uh, innovations in the processing that's gonna allow us to achieve a higher degree of functionality. And this is not really a new concept, but it's perhaps used in a new way. And that is the idea of achieving undercuts in your uh, resist profile. This can be done in many ways. Uh, one of the simplest ways to explain is a bilayer resist. And when you expose the bilayer resist, assuming that the lower resist develops more quickly than the top resist, then you'll get an undercutting laterally, which creates the profile shown in figure three. If you then do a directional evaporation of a metal, uh, it will of course deposit and be shadowed uh, by that undercut profile. And you have these small gaps that now exist underneath the undercut. If you then deposit a dielectric conformally via atomic layer deposition, and then you perform liftoff, what you get is a small extension of the dielectric into the undercut region. And this is now gonna present a sublithographic resolution dielectric extension that goes beyond your original electrode. And that's gonna be useful as you'll see moving forward. To show you that this works, I'm showing you a couple of AFM images after we perform the liftoff. And you see this beautiful step-like behavior. The thick region is where we have the electrode with a dielectric on top. And then neighboring that, we just have the dielectric itself. And the spatial extent is set by the degree of undercut that you engineer into your bilayer resist profile. In this case, uh, we can achieve uh, down to sub 100 nanometer resolution. And this works not only for E-beam lithography, but also photolithography. In other words, the resolution of the undercut is at least an order of magnitude lower than you achieve uh, for the photolithographically a pattern feature. But to be honest with you, it's not really about high resolution because you can get 100 nanometers in a lot of ways. The point is, is that this dielectric ex extension is self-aligned to the original electrode. And that now becomes quite useful in a lot of contexts. The first is to make short channel transistors. In particular, if I were to first put down a semiconductor such as MOS2, pattern one electrode, and then use that undercut profile to have a dielectric extension uh, onto the MOS2, I can now ev evaporate a second electrode. I don't need to worry about aligning it with the first one because this dielectric prevents shorting between the two electrodes. And the channel length is now set by the dielectric extension. So this can be easily down to 100 nanometers or less without even trying. Now this device is not only a short channel uh, transistor, but also because this top electrode extends via the dielectric over the channel, this electrode, which can play the role of the source of the drain in the transistor, can also electrostatically modulate the channel. And as a result, you get a very a strong electrostatic modulation, stronger than you'd get from a typical back-gated or traditional top-gated transistor. And you can see this very clearly in the transfer characteristic, where depending upon which of these electrodes you set as the source or the drain, you see dramatic changes in the current on-off ratio. Where this is perhaps more interesting is in the output curves, the IDVD curves. And if you look at short channel uh, 2D semiconductor transistors, they inevitably will show you output curves like you see here on the right. And what you'll notice is that they have a very poor current saturation. Pinch off is not easily achieved in the short channel limit in 2D semiconductors. However, with the source gated designs, since we have this additional electrostatic gating from the source electrode, in addition uh, to that coming from the gate, we can now see in the output curve very beautiful current saturation. This is almost textbook uh, behavior, and it's enabled by the electrostatics provided by the 2D semiconductor and the geometry enabled by the self-aligned dielectric extension. Now to show you how this works, I'm going to depict here some modeling results showing you the electrostatic potential in one of these devices. So again, to walk you through this, the red here is the MOS2 semiconductor. This is one of our electrodes. This is the second electrode. And then we have an underlying dielectric and then a back gate 
And if we were to run this as a traditional backgated transistor as shown here, you can see that the gate, of course, does begin to deplete the channel, um, but it doesn't deplete it particularly efficiently. On the other hand, if we go to a drain-gated geometry, again, we can see evidence of pinch-off occurring, but the pinch-off is pretty similar to what we got in the backgated case. It's okay, but not very thorough. And this is why we see incomplete current saturation in the output curve. In contrast for the source-gated case, where now we're getting pinch-off occurring not only at the contact, but throughout the entire channel, we now very strongly turn off the device and we see beautiful current saturation. The point is, is that when you have 2D semiconductors and a more complicated 3D device geometry, you can achieve electrostatic control that would be very difficult, if not impossible, to achieve in bulk semiconductors. And so let's take this one step further. Let's combine now that concept with heterojunctions. And so what we're going to do is put down our first semiconductor, such as MOS2. We're going to put down two contacts to it, use our dielectric extension method to have small dielectric extensions into the semiconductor channel. We can then put down a second semiconductor in this particular schematic. We're imagining putting down another 2D material like black phosphorus, and we can transfer this using traditional transfer methodology. And then we can proceed to put down the top contacts to this heterojunction. And the beauty here is that as long as the top contact goes over the original contact, this dielectric will ensure no shorting. And so this device geometry gives you a nearly vertical heterojunction with guaranteed no shorting, which will be quite important when we go to porous semiconductors like carbon nanotubes. We can also uh, then put down another dielectric in the top gate, and that allows us to have now dual gating of this PN heterojunction diode. This is a much more sophisticated geometry than I began the talk with. Here's a cross section of the device. Again, in the bottom, we have MOS2, a bottom contact, and a dielectric extension. We then have our top semiconductor, black phosphorus, the top contact, a line at the bottom contact with guaranteed no shorting. We then put down a top dielectric and a top gate. And this device will operate in two terminals with the current emerging from the bottom contact going through the MOS2, around the corner, and back up through the black phosphorus, the top contact, both sides of the device available for gating. If you now look at the resulting current voltage characteristics, you achieve greater electrostatic control than we had with the traditional bottom gated design. And that's shown here in the rectification ratio. We can tune this rectification ratio by orders of magnitude via both the top and the bottom gate. More interestingly, we can achieve the traditional anti-ambipolar response I showed you before. But because we have a second gate, we can now tune the, this characteristic. For example, we can tune exactly where the peak is in the anti-ambipolar characteristic, and also the level of the current or the height of this curve. Now that's a greater degree of control than I had previously, but I'll note that in this current design, the control of those two parameters, namely the peak position and height, are not independent. You see that it's, it's sort of switching concurrently. So that's better than we had before, but not as high level of control as we would want for neuromorphics. In any event, let's look at this device and break it down. One detail that I didn't mention but is possible in this device is that the top semiconductor does not need to be the same area as the bottom semiconductor. And in fact, when they are different areas, what you, what you introduce are additional current pathways. In addition to going through the heterojunction and around the corners I just described, you also have the possibility of the current going through the top semiconductor and then out laterally through the neighboring n-type semiconductor to the bottom contact. And the reason I'm stressing the difference between I1 and I2 is that if I have a top gate, that top gate is going to modulate I2 much more strongly than I1 since the top semiconductor will partially screen the top gate, whereas for I2, it will not be screened. The bottom line is that if you try to uh, reduce this single device into conventional circuit elements, it requires four elements to do so, one P-type FET, two N-type FETs, one of which is single-gated, one of which is dual-gated, in addition to a dual-gated PN heterojunction. The point I'm making here is that 2D materials with carefully designed three-dimensional device geometries allow you to pack a lot of functionality into a small amount of space, and that gives you unprecedented control over the current voltage characteristic.
Now, once you realize that the overlap between the P and N is the design parameter, you can now optimize for that. And so this is our latest design. It just was published in the last uh, couple of weeks. And what we do now is we use two wafer scale uh, low dimensional semiconductors, namely CBD grown MOS2. Now by 2020, we can grow this nicely at wafer scale. Uh, we still use uh, carbon nanotubes as a P-type semiconductor, because uh, in our view, it's better than a lot of the 2D semiconductors in terms of uniformity. And in addition, it gives us a difference in the top versus bottom gating. And that asymmetry in the electrostatic gating will give us further control over the current voltage characteristic. In any event, you can see here that the MOS2 and CNT films are intentionally offset to give us additional current pathways beyond going simply through the header junction. And when you do this and you do it right, uh, what you now achieve is full control over the anti-ambipolar current voltage characteristic. You can now see that we can tune the peak height separately from the peak position. In addition, we can tune the peak width. And when you achieve this full control over the anti-ambipolar characteristic, you're now in a position to achieve much more exquisite uh, neuronal voltage spiking behavior. In other words, this device is now optimized for neuromorphic functionality. And what you'll notice is that these curves all have a nice Gaussian characteristic to them. And so you'll often see me refer to them moving forward as a Gaussian heterojunction transistor. And so to illustrate this point, uh, let me now show you the incorporation of a Gaussian heterojunction transistor into a simple circuit. This circuit consists of the Gaussian heterojunction transistor, two conventional transistors, and then some passive circuit elements like resistors and capacitors that allow us to tune the timing of the resulting uh, voltage response. And what you can see is that if this is set up correctly, now you can achieve via one input, namely a synaptic current, which would be comparable to the synaptic current in a conventional neuron. Once this current level reaches a certain threshold, this circuit will begin to spike. And this spiking behavior looks almost identical to the action potential that's seen in conventional biological neurons. Now, why this occurs will take a little bit of uh, time, so let me try to step you through it. But the bottom line is, if you don't follow the subsequent discretion, is that the fully tunable anti-ambipolar response now allows you to achieve artificial neuronal spiking, competitive learning, and a variety of other spiking circuits to achieve increasing functionality closer and closer to biological systems. So for those of you who are interested in how this circuit works, let me quickly step you through it. So let me begin with where the circuit begins. And when the circuit begins, uh, we have all the transistors off, T1, T2, and the Gaussian heterojunction transistor off. That means that the voltage Vm is low and the voltage Vtg is high. At this point, we're gonna be sitting at this position on the transfer characteristic of the Gaussian heterojunction transistor. What we then do is turn on the synaptic current. And as we turn on the synaptic current, we're gonna to begin to charge this capacitor C1, increasing Vm. And that's what you see here. Vm starts to slowly increase as we charge capacitor one. And we begin to slowly move to the left on this transfer curve. At this point though, uh, the transistors all remain off. However, as Vm increases, eventually you turn on T1. And when T1 turns on, you're now going to pull down VTG. As VTG gets pulled down and VM turns up, you now dramatically and quickly move to the left on the transfer curve. And in particular, you go over the peak position. That means that the Gaussian heterojunction transistor turns on and you now have a huge current being input discontinuously through that transistor in addition to the synaptic current. That's gonna quickly increase VM as you see here, VM spikes, which takes us to 0.3 on this curve. Now, once you're at point three, you're gonna to continue to increase Vm. But as you increase Vm, what's going to happen is you're gonna to move to the left on this curve, thereby weakening the response from the Gaussian heterojunction transistor due to its anti-antipolar characteristic. Concurrently, you're gonna begin charging C2, which is gonna turn on T2. So what you would have at this point in time is T2 fighting with the Gaussian heterojunction transistor for, for superiority in the circuit. And since this transistor is getting weaker as VM increases and T2 is getting stronger, T2 wins that battle, which is gonna 
discontinuously pull VM down and VM therefore plummets, leading to the spiking behavior. When VM plummets, all the devices turn off again, you reset the circuit, and then you charge and you repeatedly achieve the spiking behavior. The whole point of this is that exactly where you move to at point three on the anti-mupolar curve will dictate how strong the Gaussian transistor is compared to the competing n-type transistor in the circuit. And if you push this now to the point where you're farther to the left on the anti-mupolar characteristic, this becomes weaker, T2 becomes stronger, which means that the circuit's gonna spike more aggressively or quickly. And you can see that here. As I tune now the position of the anti-mupolar circuit or anti-mupolar transistor, I can now achieve differences in the timing of the spiking response. The point here is that without redesigning the entire circuit, I can achieve control over my spiking response just via the gate voltages applied to the anti-mupolar device. And of course, if you begin fiddling with the circuit, changing the timing by varying the resistors and capacitors, you can achieve other types of spiking behavior. The first one that I just showed you is constant spiking, but if you change the resistors and capacitors, you can achieve different spiking behavior, such as class one spiking. This is observed in some neurons, where as you increase the magnitude of the synaptic current, you vary the rate of the spiking response. You can also achieve spike latency, where if you apply a spike to the synaptic current, then at some delayed point in time, your circuit spikes once. You can also have an integrator response where repeated synaptic currents, if they occur close to each other in time, drive spiking in the neuron, whereas if they're separated in time, the spiking is suppressed. And if you read this paper, you're going to see that there's another half dozen or so different spiking behaviors, all enabled by the same Gaussian heterojunction transistor. Okay, so hopefully I've convinced you that these anti-antipolar heterojunctions allow you to achieve very exquisite and complicated spiking behavior that mimics a lot of behavior in neurons. But I, what I want to stress is that that's only half the story. In a, a neuromorphic uh, circuit, we not only need spiking behavior, but also the memory and information processing behavior co-located as we have in the brain. And that's going to require a new type of device that we call a MEM transistor. So for this part of the talk, we're going to be using MOS2 grown by chemical vapor deposition. We're going to be using the so-called powder CBD approach. And the reason that I mentioned this is that powder CBD is famous for being riddled with defects. And those defects are going to be critical to the operation of this device. In particular, by varying the temperature of the sulfur and moly trioxide powders, we can vary the stoichiometry of our MOS2. It turns out we're going to want sub-stoichiometric MOS2 with a high level of sulfur, sulfur vacancies and also polycrystalline MOS2, which have grain boundaries that are also important for the device functionality. To show you that indeed CBD MOS2 is not very high quality, here's an STM image of one of our films, and you can see there are defects all over the place, and I label them in this figure here. Uh, the defects that are most important and are dominant in our films are uh, vacancies, namely sulfur vacancies, and sulfur vacancies are valuable in this uh, device because they act as n-type dopants. And those n-type dopants are going to be critical to the device functionality. The other thing that I'll stress is that these are polycrystalline films. And if you look at this in atomic force microscopy, you can see uh, quite clearly uh, the grain boundary in AFM imaging or in STM, it lights up even more. Now, this is again not particularly uh, surprising. Anyone who's grown uh, MOS2 via powder CBD knows that you knows that you get polycrystalline films. And a lot of people don't like these grain boundaries, but they're actually going to be useful in this particular device context. And the reason they're useful is based upon these two fundamental studies. These were not done uh, by our lab, uh, but we saw them and we were inspired by them. And what these uh, two studies showed is that if you have a vacancy in a transition metal dichalcogenide in close proximity to a grain boundary, then the energy barrier to motion for that vacancy is significantly lowered. In other words, the grain boundaries act, if you will, like a highway to facilitate vacancy motion in polycrystalline transition metal dichalcogenide films. And this is shown not only in atomic resolution TEM imaging, but also in theoretical studies.
And what that suggests is that if we created a substoichiometric polycrystalline MOS2 film, then we should be able to derive vacancy motion with relatively low excitation. And that would allow us to reconfigure the doping profile in our device and thereby change its current voltage characteristics in a non-volatile manner. And so we set off to do this. Our initial studies uh, were done on individual grain boundary devices. And so you can see one of our devices here. This is before we put down the electrodes. Uh, we see uh, a single grain boundary occurring between these two flakes. Uh, we can identify this in AFM and then use EBM lithography to pattern electrodes with respect to the grain boundaries. And if you take such a device and you now apply a two terminal a current voltage curve, what you see is that the device starts in a high resistance or low current state, and then at some critical voltage, it discontinuously switches into a low resistance or, or high current state and stays in that state until you go to the opposite bias polarity. So you see this strong hysteretic two terminal response, which is very reminiscent of a memristor. Of course, memristors are not new, as so there's not uh, any uh, uh, real news here, except for the fact that because this is an atomically thin material, we can now gate it and convert this two terminal memristor into a three terminal gate tunable memristor. And depending upon the geometry of the grain boundary with respect to the channel, you can achieve different types of gate tunability. And this particular geometry shown in A, you're tuning the trip voltage, namely where you switch between the high and low resistance states. And this uh, geometry, you can achieve modulation of the amplitude of the current flow while maintaining the memristor loop. The bottom line is that this device now has both memristor and transistor characters, so we can call it a mem transistor for short. Now the problem with this initial design is that it depended upon the geometry of the grain boundary with respect to the channel, which of course is difficult to control at wafer scale. And so we thought about this for a while and eventually decided to uh, go to a different geometry. And that was, instead of trying to make single grain boundary devices, let's make the grains as small as possible, such that we're gonna have many grain boundaries per device. And the idea is that now we can average over the stochastic variations in the grain boundaries at the device level, and in that way get a uniform response. And indeed, when you use uh, a grain size, which is smaller than your device dimensions, you now see very high device yield, which is not only high yield over large areas, but also between multiple fabrication batches. Well, the resulting current voltage characteristics are shown here. Well, they're similar to what I showed you before, but a little bit different. If we look at the two terminal response on the right, you can see that you see a strong a memristive loop, and that is uh, similar to what I showed you before. One thing that's interesting is that in the opposite uh, polarity, that memristive loop is smaller. This is our first hint that we have some asymmetry in the device. And indeed, if you analyze these curves carefully, which is shown in, with the theoretical fit in green, these are actually shock key barrier devices. What's happening is, is that the vacancies are moving in, out, in and out of the shock key a contact region, changing the doping locally, uh, which of course exponentially changes the charge injection across the Shockey junction. And as a result, at one bias polarity, you're going to see a reverse versus forward bias a Shockey response, and that's why the response is uh, asymmetric. In addition, you can gate this device and you see very strong gate modulation with a further gate tunability of 10 to the sixth. These devices are very stable with high endurance and long retention times. Now, the beauty of this uh, new MEM transistor design is that you can achieve a variety of neuromorphic functionality. Uh, one of those functionalities is so-called long-term potentiation and depression. In this functionality, what you're doing is applying a voltage pulse uh, across the source drain of uh, bias. And what that does is it begins to step you up that memristive response, thereby increasing in a non-volatile manner the current through the device. And if you apply the opposite bias polarity, you can march yourself down that response. I'll note that the uh, rate at which you move up and down will depend upon the spacing between the pulses, and that's shown here uh, in the delta T uh, versus synaptic weight curve. That's, of course, interesting. I'll note that you can do similar things in memristors, but what's different about this device compared to a conventional memristor 
is firstly, you can use the gate voltage to tune that synaptic response, as I already mentioned. But more fundamentally, uh, because we have a planar device geometry, it is now possible for us to add additional contacts to the channel region. So normally in the MEM transistor, you would use contacts five and six as the source drain, and then you'd have a back gate. And that's what I showed you before. But there's nothing preventing us from putting additional contacts into the channel region, which we did here. And remember, what's happening in this device as we apply the bias across contacts five and six is that we're driving vacancy motion through the channel and therefore reconfiguring the doping profile in the device. And that's most dramatically observed at the Shockey contact at six, but it's also occurring in the channel itself, which implies that if I were to now measure the voltage uh, between, uh, for example, electrodes two and four, uh, the current through two and four will be modulated by voltage pulses, voltage pulses of electrodes five and six, and that's shown here. The current voltage between points two and four is modulated by the voltage applied to five and six. This is a so-called heterosynaptic response. This is something that is observed in uh, biological neurons, uh, but not uh, previously achieved in solid state electronic devices. And of course, this heterosynaptic response can be further tuned with the gate bias, something that actually is difficult to achieve uh, in a biological system. So this functionality now gives us the high degree of interconnectivity that allows us to better mimic uh, the brain. Now I'll conclude in the last few minutes with our very latest work. Uh, this has uh, been submitted uh, for, for publication, uh, not uh, available in the literature yet, hopefully soon. What we're doing now is taking the MEM transistor, which before was just bottom gated, and introducing a second gate, a top gate. So this is now a dual gated MEM transistor. And we're gonna do this in a so-called crossbar array, which is gonna allow us to address individual MEM transistors in a two-dimensional array. The first thing that this uh, dual gating allows us to do is to use one gate to turn the device on and off, and then the other gate can be used in order to address a particular device, turn it on, and at that point, we can program it using the source string bias. And this is, of course, what you typically do in a memristor crossbar array. The problem in a memristor crossbar array is that if you just have the memristor, there's no way of determining which device is on or off. And as a result, you get a lot of crosstalk in your two terminal memristor arrays. And the way that that's typically solved is you need to have another device, typically a transistor, that's needed to address each and every point in the crossbar array. And once you add another transistor to the memristor crossbar array, you begin to compromise this high device density. In contrast with a dual gated mem transistor, we can achieve that crosstalk minimization for free by using the second gate. And that's shown here. If I put one device, for example, in a high resistance state and then program the other device multiple times, we see that the first device stays in the high resistance state. The same thing is true if we put that first device in a low resistance state initially. And so this allows us to achieve crosstalk minimization or reduction of the so-called sneak current issue uh, by utilizing the dual gate geometry. But I think more interestingly, what the dual gate allows you to do is to achieve greater control over the long-term depression and potentiation. As you can see here, that potentiation and depression behavior is now modulated by the gate bias. And it's a pretty strong modulation. This is a log scale on the y-axis. And therefore we can achieve so-called gate tunable learning that could be useful in a lot of artificial neural network type circuits. Indeed, one a particular uh, set of potentiation depression curves that can be realized is to now vary the dual gating to achieve a high degree of linearity and symmetry in the potentiation and depression. Uh, this is a particular potentiation and depression curve that is of high interest for doing classification of images. And in particular, by utilizing this response in a simulated artificial neural network, we're able to show that dual-gated MOS2 MEM transistors can now get within a few percent of the ideal recognition rate if you had perfectly symmetric and linear potentiation depression curves. So this is quite useful in a lot of classification applications that are now being explored in neuromorphic computing. All right, with that, I think I'm out of time. Again, I want to reiterate my two main points today. The first is that dual-gated 
mixed dimensional MOS2 carbon nanotube heterojunctions give you exquisite control over the antiambipolar response, and that enables diverse neuron spiking responses. And then secondly, polycrystalline MOS2 thin film devices now provide a pathway to large area arrays of gate tunable multi-terminal MEM transistors that allow us to have information processing and memory co-located at the device level. With that, let me conclude and acknowledge on my research group at Northwestern University. This is a very diverse and talented team. I want to thank them especially. Also, of course, thank the funding agencies for supporting the work in my lab. And with that, I will conclude and take any questions. Thank you very much. I, I, I have uh, two questions. Uh, the first one, uh, I saw in slide 32 or 33, I think, uh, there is uh, 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 one peak is, is considered a, a, as a spiking behavior. Yeah, this one, this one, 32. I see in in the spike latency, you're talking here ab about uh, spiking behavior, yes? Yes. Yes. Yeah, so so I, I saw just one peak in, in one in one uh, in the third one, and also the integrator. We can yep. consider it. We can consider it as uh, as spiking behavior. It, it, it just one peak is, is not behavior on all all the, the time or all the way. Yes. Yeah. So so to be clear, uh, there's there's a variety of different spiking responses in biological neurons. Uh, the one that I went through in the most detail is what I call constant spiking. And that is whenever the synaptic current is uh, on, you're going to drive a constant spiking of that neuron. And so that was the case that I showed you. Uh, but in this paper, uh, we take you through in detail uh, some mm. subtle variations to the circuit, changing, for example, the passive elements like the resistors and capacitors. And if you change those, you can now change the functionality to what we call either spike latency or integrator response. And spike latency, now if I apply a pulse to the synaptic current, then at some later point in time, so you can see there's a slight delay here in time, then the neuron spikes. So the latency means that there's a delay between the driving spike and the resulting spike of the neuron. The integrator is another response seen in some biological systems where if you apply multiple synaptic spikes and they are close together in time, that drives spiking of the neuron. Whereas if those two current spikes are offset in time, then you do not see the spike driven. And you can see here that this doesn't undergo the full spiking that we achieved when they're close together in time. Yes, yes. Okay, the, the second question is, uh, I, I just remarked that uh, you, you used uh, uh, AL203 as dielectric. I saw that, uh, I, I think, uh, from the first, uh, what, when you talk about dielectric, I, I don't remember the, the slide. And uh, uh, at the end, when, when you, you mentioned that you put, uh, you put a layer of MOS2 and then AL2 or uh, O3 as, as dielectric, uh, didn't you use uh, another one? Didn't you try yeah, so, another one? So we, uh, we, we use uh, Illumina or Hafnia, typically. Hafnia has the advantage uh, that it's higher dielectric constant. And gives us better electrostatic control. Uh, but in many circumstances, Illumina is sufficient. And mm. for those of you who do atomic layer deposition, you know Illumina is sort of the easiest ALD chemistry out there. So my students, uh, when AL203 is sufficient, always use it because the yield is very high. It sort of uh, always works. Uh, but if we need better control, then, then we go to Hafnia and we push the thickness. Uh, that, uh, of course, will decrease your device yield, especially in a university lab, which doesn't have uh, sort of world-class clean rooms that you have in, in industry. Mm -hmm. uh, but everything that we did here, if, if you uh, have a good clean room and good control, uh, could be done with Hafnia. There, there's, there's no reason uh, to use Illumina other than convenience. Okay. 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 Thank, uh, thank you, Khaled. And there's an interesting question from Ralph Page from Stanford University. Ralph, can I please ask your question. Sure. So, uh, I forget what slide it was, but you were showing uh, some uh, examples of uh, moving vacancy devices. And I just wondered uh, what kind of uh, 
bandwidth to expect from, yeah, that, there it is. Uh, what kind of bandwidth do you think is going to be possible with something like this? Yeah, so I would say, uh, you know, speed and all um, sort of devices that require mass transport will be slower than uh, devices based on a you know, charge transport. So that, that's an issue. I don't think it's unique to this device. Memristors have similar behavior. The question is, can you design the device in a manner where that uh, motion can be minimized in terms of distance? And that's one of the nice things about uh, the new design, or not, not new, but the latest design that we have, is this device uh, is really dominated by the shot key contact. And you just need to move the vacancies in and out of the shot key region. So that's a relatively a small distance, and that gives you a, you know, a quicker uh, response. But you know, these devices are not going to uh, be as fast as uh, conventional charge transport-based devices. The good news is that if we're trying to mimic uh, neurons, uh, neurons are also not particularly fast. They tend to operate at kilohertz frequencies, and I think kilohertz will be no problem here. My, I'm pretty optimistic you can get to megahertz maybe push uh, towards gigahertz um, but to go much faster than that i think will be challenging has has there been a measurement yet of the roll off yeah so our devices um, we haven't taken any measures yet to minimize overlap capacitance and so that that's really dominating the time response uh, at this point uh, but your your point is well taken and uh, we're working on sort of minimizing overlap capacitance so we can begin to look intrinsically at what the mass transport is doing in terms of limiting speed. Okay. Thanks a lot, Ralph. Uh, let's move on to Emiliano Palecci from the uh, University of Lille. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, so my question is about the reliability because uh, hundreds of sweeps seems very good results compared to similar devices. But I would say that for, for practical application, you need much more. So do you have any idea about how to improve it or differently put? Is this an intrinsic limitation of your device due to movement of uh, atoms or can be improved? Yeah, so we, we see that the reliability is, is relatively high. Uh, you can cycle these, um, you know, with certainly hundreds of times what we show in our paper. Uh, we've since cycled them much longer and they seem to be robust. Uh, the retention seems to be uh, quite high. I think the, the bigger concern that I have is uh, in the current devices, uh, they're pretty big uh, because the, the grains are still at the, say, micron or slightly submicron length scale. And so what you really want to have is uh, either a lower grain size or a different uh, means of mass transport. And that's what we're working on now in our lab. Uh, we think this uh, polycrystalline MOS2 design is good as a proof of concept, uh, but I do tend to agree with, I think what you're suggesting that relying upon defects, which are you know, randomly uh, distributed uh, in the crystal is going to lead to reliability and ultimately homogeneity issues if you try to push the device dimensions smaller. So what we instead need to do is intentionally introduce the defects via lithography. Uh, and of course, that's what we do in conventional semiconductor devices with doping. Mm. So I think that is a viable pathway and we hope to unveil those results soon. Thank you very much. So let's move on to, thank you very much for the question. Let's move to uh, Victor Liang from Nanjing, uh, Nanjing University. Uh, thanks for the host. Uh, I have a, two questions to ask. The first question is about uh, uh, your uh, nature communication papers. Uh, in that papers, you just mentioned, use a junction device and with other few uh, transistors to build a circuit to mimic the, uh, uh, Gaussian uh, the the behaviors. Uh, so my question is, since you already use the capacitor, the inner circuit. So, is that is is 
is it still possible uh, uh, scalable in the future? I mean, uh, is it possible to develop a high density the circuit in the future to let say let's say uh, mimic the the very large scale of uh, like the brain? Yeah, so it depends what what uh, what you're competing against. So if you wanted to achieve uh, the similar spiking response in conventional silicon CMOS, for example, mm -hmm. you, you, you can do it. And, and we cite those papers in this nature come. Uh, but if you look at those devices, uh, they tend to have at least 10, and in many cases, a couple dozen transistors to achieve the same functionality. Mm -hmm. So the number of devices is actually quite low here. And the, the capacitors, I think, are sort of very easy to, to implement. In fact, there's a lot of capacitance that we have in our circuits that we try to get rid of. Uh, it's not hard to add a capacitance uh, that sort of comes for free wherever you have electrodes and um, dielectrics. So the, I think what really limits you is not the passive elements, but the active elements. And uh, here, the active elements are, are down to three. Uh, and perhaps we can do better, uh, but even if we can't, this is still a significant fraction better than you achieve with silicon CMOS. But to me, what's you know more interesting is that in silicon CMOS, you can design a particular circuit for a particular response, and then if you want a different response, you have to design a new circuit. Uh, whereas here, as I noted uh, briefly in this slide, we don't need to redesign the circuit, we just change the biasing uh, to the dual gated uh, Gaussian heterojunction transistor, shifting around its anti polar response, and that dynamically changes the spiking. So, this is a much more reconfigurable uh, device uh, and circuit uh, than you would have in conventional silicon CMOS. Okay, thanks. Uh, my second question is about your last few slides, uh, where you uh, just to show uh, you have built the, the uh, small scale, uh, the dual gate uh, memory stiff uh, uh, cross bar. So my question is, uh, so what is the uh, uh, exact size of this cross bar? Yeah, so we're just, we're just patterning this with photolithography, so it's proof of concept. So you can see the scale bar here. So these devices are, you know, photolithographically defined in a university, so we're talking microns. Um, of course, uh, if we I went to a proper clean room like at a company and we could push this down a lot farther. The real, I don't think it's really a lithographic question. The, the question as I alluded to before is, if you scale the mem transistor channel, mm -hmm. does the device still work? Yeah. And you know, that, that in the current design, you know, requires going to smaller grain size. And in fact, there are other groups that have since shown that uh, as you scale the grain size, you reduce the dimensions of the device and therefore the operating voltage. But as I mentioned before, I don't think that's the end game strategy uh, because uh, at some point, the material becomes amorphous if the grain size becomes too small. And I'm not convinced it'll work in that limit. And so what you'd instead want to have is a means of intentionally introducing the, the defects lithographically uh, like we do with doping and conventional semiconductors. That, I think, is the key to scaling. And in fact, uh, there's a paper from Wei Lu's group at University of Michigan in Nature Materials, I believe, uh, where he indeed did this uh, with lithium ions and multi-layer uh, MOS2, uh, which you know is one possible way of achieving that functionality. Mm -hmm. So is that materials, uh, MOS2 is uh, CVD growth the single layer or, or few layer, single layer? In these devices, it's single layer. Um, in the Weilu device uh, where they are using ion intercalation, then it's multi-layer. It's a few layers, yeah. yeah. All right, so that's question also is, is one that comes later. So uh, let's uh, hear uh, one question from Yuan Yuan Shi from IMAC. So you can, you can pick which one. Okay, thank you for the host and nice presentation. Actually, I have one question, uh, one question uh, two questions. One question is related to this two gate uh, member transistor crossbar arrays. So, in this uh, arrays, uh, how you avoid the device uh, uh, are affected by the neighboring device? Uh, 
Um, yeah. Because yeah, this so is the, not the, like a member yeah, the, ba the basic. Yeah. yeah. So, so the the way the the crosstalk is minimized is that uh, the overall response of the device is a function of both gates, and consequently, uh, you can apply a bias to turn off all of the devices in a particular row, and then only the sorry, in a particular row could all be turned off unless the column top gate is biased to turn on that point. And so by the biases applied to the row and the column gates, uh, then we can achieve uh, the device being uh, either on or off at that particular point in the array. And then you can program it with the source drain, and that allows you uh, to only influence that device and not its neighbors. So they are controlled by the top gate uh, bells. That's right. I mean, you're 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 picking it out uh, via the voltages applied to the gates, and then you're programming it with the source drain. Okay, right. I see. So uh, let's uh, move on to. Uh, thanks a lot. Sorry, <laughs> I still yes, have I, another question. Yes, but let. I think we we in in the interest of time, yeah. I think we should uh, move on. Is that okay? Yes, I move to another question. Yeah. No, I think so we will move on. You and Yun, I think we will move on to uh, to finish the last questions in the in the list. Is that okay, okay. Okay. Sure. Thank okay. you. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, Jabez uh, McClellan from uh, NIST. Please. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, so one of the main uh, reasons for doing uh, coming up with new devices for neuromorphics is has to do with the, um, the overall energy consumption of a system. And I'm just wondering if you've done any estimates where you imagine you have a whole array of these types of devices in, in a system and, and whether there's a global energy estimate or something you could say about, yes, this will be a lot more energy efficient than like a, a something that's completely based on CMOS. Yeah, so uh, yeah, one, one good example of that, and we do that energy estimate in this paper, is uh, indeed uh, just by decreasing the number of devices uh, you get an obvious uh, improvement in in energy consumption uh, so that in this case that's sort of a simple argument in the case of the mem transistor uh, the basic argument is uh, the one made by many in neuromorphic computing and that is what ultimately kills you in power consumption is the von neumann architecture and the movement of data between the memory and the processing blocks. And a lot of uh, you know, neuromorphic architectures that are out there you know, try to minimize that by you know, multi-core designs where you have multiple processors, multiple memory blocks, and therefore a less data motion between the two. Uh, but if you take this down to the device level, that's the ultimate limit of that concept. And so in principle, if you could uh, integrate it at high density, uh, there should be architectures enabled that are sort of fundamentally different than von Neumann uh, with uh, much lower power consumption. Thank you. All right. So, uh, so we let's move on to uh, Mukesh Kumar Takur from uh, National Yang Ming Institute uh, University. Mukesh, are you there? Uh, hello, can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Yeah, thank you, Professor, for a nice talk. I have a basic question about the slide number 22. How, how you fabricate this kind of like the 2D, 3D device structure? And what is the success rate of these devices? Because it seems very complicated. So for the like, for a simple lab purpose, can we, uh, can you make, can we make these devices in a simple lab? We don't have much facility like this. Yeah, so I think the, the, the question is, uh, you know, this looks complicated and maybe is there a, a yield problem? Uh, that, that's sort of the beauty of the design is that it's, it's exceptionally high yield. Uh, and the reason is, is basically this, uh, this dielectric extension here is very forgiving. In that when you try to make a vertical heterojunction out of van der Waals materials, the issue you run into is shorting 
between the top and the bottom contact. In fact, if you look at vertical heterojunction devices, they're almost always with at least one of the materials being pretty thick uh, to ensure that you know, there's no pinhole in that layer. Mm -hmm. But in this design, uh, because of the dielectric right on top of the bottom contact, uh, you essentially eliminate the possibility of shorting. And consequently, uh, you get a very high device yield. And in fact, the top semiconductor no longer has to be a uh, monolithic material. It could be a porous carbon nanotube array, as I showed you, because the top contact can go through that porous array and not short because of the dielectric extension. So this is extremely uh, high yield uh, and robust process. And for this uh, device structure, you use the most uh, CBD growth MOS2 or chemical equation? Yeah, you can use whatever you want. You can use uh, scotch tape, you can use CBD grown, you can use solution process. Um, in this device here, uh, the MOS2 is CBD grown, the carbon nanotubes are solution processed. Uh, it's, as I suggested now uh, many times, extremely forgiving. Uh, so yeah, I highly recommend it to anyone who wants high yield heterojunction devices. And you know, for free, you now gain access to both sides of the junction to do dual gating. Uh, which gives you the electrostatic control that I, I talked a lot about today. Thank you so much. Okay, so we have a few questions. We have a few minutes and a few questions left. Uh, one question is from uh, Miguel Ogo from uh, Quantum Holopedia. Hello, thank you for a very interesting talk. So my question is again uh, in regards to the action potential and we could see in the uh, spiking behaviors that uh, you can regulate the frequency at which the spikes uh, occur with increasing the um, uh, synaptic current. Uh, and my question is, what is the range of the frequencies you can obtain and uh, how precisely, what is the frequency change resolution you can obtain in that way? Yeah, so uh, as I talked about before, uh, in our lab we always start with proof of concept devices where we don't uh, take a lot of measures to sort of minimize overlap capacitance and so on. And so the operating uh, times, we can get down to say milliseconds uh, with the current design. Uh, in our paper, we, uh, we estimate in a scale geometry where you, you know, more carefully manage the overlap, how fast you could go. And I think you can go faster, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, certainly into the megahertz range if you wanted. But if our goal is to mimic neurons, uh, neurons, uh, you know, across the board operate at millisecond or longer timescales. So we're basically there already if our goal is to, to mimic the action potential on a neuron. In terms of the resolution, uh, it's, it's, quite, it's quite tunable and almost continuously tunable. And it's, it's tuned, as I suggest here, by the uh, details of the uh, anti-ambipolar response, which in the dual gated a geometry, uh, we can move this around at will. And so, yeah, I think the resolution uh, of the frequency response is um, quite high. Thank you. Thank you, Miguel. Uh, so uh, our last question comes from uh, Miro Haluska from ETH Zurich. So thank you for a very nice talk. I would like to ask you about device functionality Rep, uh, about pro reproducibility of fabrication of these uh, MOS2 nanotube devices and about their time stability on air? Yeah, great question. Yeah, the, those of you who work with nanotubes sh should be worried about air stability. Uh, I didn't talk a lot about that today, but if you go back to 2015, uh, we published paper in Nature Nano where we, we took on that issue directly and you know, basically it's a problem of encapsulation and uh, those best practices are, are utilized here as well. So uh, the 2015 Nature Nano paper goes through it in gory detail, uh, but you can also learn about it in this paper here. Yes, yeah, so the encapsulation is key to get stability and these devices, you know, work uh, for as long as we've looked at them. So we're talking several months uh, to years, they seem perfectly stable. In fact, in our 2015 Nature Nano paper, we still have those devices in our lab, and they work five years later. 
So I think the stability issues basically solve the problem. In terms of the device yield, the only thing that limits our device yield uh, is that we work in university clean rooms, which are not as good as they should be. Uh, and there are, there are multiple lithography steps. And so basically, the yields of the devices is the product of the yield of each lithography step. Uh, but there's nothing intrinsic in the design uh, that would give you low yield. OK, I think the, that was it. Uh, uh, on behalf of everybody, I would like to thank you very much for an excellent talk. And thank you for taking the time to answer all these questions.